This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Neil. <laughs> well, thank you. It's, been, it's a real pleasure to be here, and it's really nice to be right after Paul, because Paul's really and his team has done, have done a really great piece of work. Uh, they continue to do good work. So. But first, um, I did want to kind of mention, uh, a lot of people wonder what this Long Island thing is, and I did want to mention that we do have a research station down in Long Island, uh, right in Riverhead, on the eastern portion of Long Island. <clears throat> Been there 94 years. We're getting ready to celebrate our 100th anniversary in about six, six more years. But we're in Suffolk County here, which is the eastern, almost two-thirds of the island, and we're a very diverse agricultural county. Most people don't know that, so whenever I go out to speak, I like to make sure that the people understand that we have a lot of agriculture out there, and we're actually uh, a very, uh, the leading county in the state of New York for uh, uh, crop agriculture as far as the wholesale value. So that's one of the reasons that Cornell's down there. Um, if you look at the total ag products, we're number two now. We used to be number one until about three years ago, but, but still we're number one for crop agriculture. We have uh, more nurseries and more greenhouses than any place else in the state of New York. Uh, vegetables were number five. Other crops like potatoes were number one and ducks and poultry were still number one. So we have a lot of agriculture and that's, that's why we're down in Long Island. And uh, we're very fortunate, our research center, we're the only one in the country that has specialists for each of the commodity zones. We have floriculture greenhouse specialists, fruit specialists, particularly uh, in the grapes, because we, we have about 2,000 acres of grapes, uh, vegetable specialists, and then ornamental specialists. And then we're also very fortunate to have the cross commodity uh, specialists, uh, two plant pathologists, Marjorie's here today, uh, a weed scientist, two entomologists, so um, we're kind of a one-stop shop, and in, in what, tr what is true theoretical extension, our stakeholders are about 50 mile radius from us, so we get to interact with them all the time. They bring in their diseases, and they bring in their insects, or we go visit them. So um, that's what we do down in Long Island. <clears throat> and also, I, uh, unlike Paul, I'm, I'm not a, a wildlife specialist. I'm, I'm a plant breeder and, and greenhouse specialist. And as Margaret had mentioned earlier, we. Um, we have been breeding uh, <clears throat> with the impatiens, and as of last year, we came up with our first two truly uh, downy mildew resistant impatiens. Marjorie and her team uh, at Long Island also helped us with that research. Uh, we're currently working, um, Yuki here in the front row is work, gonna be working with us for the next several years on uh, <clears throat> making that a seed line. Right now, if you were gonna grow this, you'd have to propagate it by cuttings. Um, also been working with Ulster Mary for many years on um, developing winter hardiness. We have several of those. Deer love those, by the way, so don't grow those if you have deer. And then we're also working on a project uh, breeding Vitex, the chase tree. Nor, um, grad student, is up there, and he's been working on that project. So that gives you a little bit about that, but <clears throat> really what we're here to talk about is deer, and deer are kind of more my hobby. Um, because I, garden, I like to garden a lot, and so uh, I've always lived in areas that have had deer populations. So, you know, people think that they're very cute, they don't wanna, sometimes they don't wanna hunt them, but um, for, for us on Long Island, deer are our number one problem for farmers, as well as many of the homeowners uh, out there that have nice gardens. So, um, You know, the original title of this talk was Deer Resistant Plants, but uh, you may have noticed that I changed it to plants that deer not, do not eat, because if you use the term deer resistant, you know, there is no plant that's resistant to deer. If a deer wants to bite it and chew it, it's going to certainly eat the plant. So uh, like that sp little spruce up there, you know, the deer don't, you don't eat the spruce, but if they take a bite, it's not resistant. It's not like iron. So, so no plant is truly resistant if a deer wants to eat it. And, you know, we have other problems, as Paul mentioned, too, you know, the rubbing antlers. So if you do come up with a garden with all these plants that are resistant to deers, then the next, the deer, the next thing you realize is that in the fall, the male deer come along and they rub the, the bark and they girdle the trees and they kill them that way. So, you know, not only do they eat it, then they step on it. You know, you'll get all kinds of physical damage. I know our boxwoods at our house have been damaged. You know, they don't eat, deer don't eat boxwoods, but they will... Uh, step on them when they're trying to reach higher levels of uh, plant material to eat. 
And then they do cosmetic damage. Um, you know, this is a classic photo of, of arborvitae hedges on Long Island. They, they just get devoured by the deer. Um, and it's, um, you know, they just nibble everything they can. And then the other part is that, you know, you're walking through your garden and you step in on all kinds of little presents that they leave. Um, and uh, so that, that's not very much fun either. Well, the, uh, Paul kind of uh, mentioned this earlier, but there are a lot of deer in the United States. That according to a 2014 study, uh, there's 15 million deer. And then as he also mentioned, we have other problems like car accidents associated. This was from the insurance company online. Um, farmers, you know, uh, have Im you know, immeasurable damage from the, um, from the deer. And, and of course, you know, those are hostas. So when I say farmers, I include the greenhouse floriculture industry. And then Lyme disease uh, and all kinds of other diseases. You know, the disease now that makes you allergic to meat. You've heard about that one, right? It's a true disease. I thought it was... I thought it was a fairy tale when I first heard about it, but last year we've had so many people that have come down with that disease now that they can't eat any kind of meat protein. So, you know, deer do cause a lot of problems. We put a fence around our farm. We have uh, 68 acres at, at the extension center at a cost of about $80,000. We put a fence around the entire farm and uh, we'd be out of business if we didn't have the fence. But as Paul mentioned, you should be about eight foot fence and then um, the fence and the deer management or hunting are the only ways you're actually going to truly uh, be sure that you're going to get rid of your deer. Uh, Paul also mentioned repellents, and you didn't mention liquid fence, Paul. I was surprised because this is a really good, this is a really good uh, repellent. We have tried this in several situations, deer out also. These are two that work very well. Um, liquid fence smells really, really bad, badly. Um, so if you spray it before a party, people will stay away from your house. Uh, on the other hand, deer out smells like cloves. It's, very, it's much more pleasant. So uh, the other problem with deer fence is that it's a very thick mixture. So when you put it in a spray bottle, it really clogs up the spray bottle quickly. So, but they both work uh, dependably. <clears throat> I have a question on that. Sure. Well, I've heard people say that, uh, but we do have a, a nursery landscape environments in Long Island, which is in Mattatuck, New York. They have beautiful gardens that are uh, subject to deer attack, and they, they consistently spray with one uh, every week. And that's the other thing that we didn't mention earlier, Paul didn't mention, is that when he, he did that study, uh, he sprayed once and then saw how things um, were repelled for several months later. But if you're in a homeowner situation, you should, you should reapply, you know, because they will wash off, deer will get, you know, the smell will get less um, you know, unpleasant to the deer. So um, I, I don't think there's any, the, there's, I don't think there's any problem to rotating back and forth from one to the other, but I don't think you necessarily need to, because we've tried areas with just liquid fence and just deer out and it was fine. Yes. I'm not sure what's, uh, what's in here, uh, but it smells really bad. But, but <laughs> so some... Oh, uh, the question, I think what the question is, is do I find that these work for buck rubbing also? Um, not really, not really. Uh, we use fences, I think I'll show, uh, well, in just a couple of slides, I'll show you that there's different ways we've worked. We're going to talk about plants, but there's other ways you can do it, and, and one is just to elevate your plants, okay? As a homeowner, we can do this. Of course, in a commercial business, you can't. These are all pictures from my house, but you can see we put window boxes in where they can't reach. Uh, but I will say this little, um, little uh, walkway in between the house and the garage, they have come into there and eaten our plants in there, so there's no guarantees. But... You know, the, uh, we uh, use uh, hanging, the window boxes, we use hanging baskets uh, where they can't reach. And then even on our hen house, um, we put a, a green roof on, so on top of the hen house just to make them mad, you know, because they can't. <laughs> <laughs> and the hen house s serves dual purpose because not only 
uh, is it a place for the chickens to live, but we let them out at night and they eat ticks. So, you know, tick, the chickens are very good at tick elimination, but they don't get them all because I will tell you, I get, every day I'm out in the garden, I get a tick, so. And the other one is to fence your plants. Uh, Paul mentioned that too, but on a homeowner situation, we do that, we fence them in, it looks really ugly, but if you want a rhododendron on Long Island, you better fence it or else it's gonna be eaten. Typically what we do, this is a stewardia that is fenced in. It was a very, it was kind of a present and it had sentimental meanings to us, so we fenced it in. But this, just this year, um, it's been big enough, uh, thick enough that I don't think the, the deer are gonna rub it. And when they start eating the lower part, that's okay. They can eat the lower part and we'll enjoy the top part. But, uh, and it's also surrounded by bayberry, which is one of my plants that I'm gonna be talking about. And uh, when deer go to rub, they like to have a clear uh, approach entrance. So with the bayberry, I hope that is also going to kind of deter them. But we're, what we're going to talk about today is choosing the right plants uh, for the garden, because you can have a beautiful garden uh, in spite of the plant, in spite of the deer uh, situation. Uh, this is another picture from my garden. Uh, we have a lot of deer, as, as I was amazed when Paul said 250 per, per square mile. Most of them are in my yard, I'm sure. <laughs> so. Um, and I also want to say I, I have a lot of faith in this, this list. You should have all, I passed out, or, or Neil had passed out the list to you all. You should all I have a lot of faith in that let list. And you'll notice that on the list that we have the asterisk plants, those are what I call my 95% plants. That means 95% of the time the deer won't touch it. But the reason we have faith in our list is that we've actually done this in a scientific manner. We've replicated these plants in different locations that have deer, pressure, uh, under controlled situations, the, the, the deer, for, so to speak. So I used to live in Connecticut for 18 years. We had gardens there that had a lot of deer, and then we moved to Long Island. And um, so we've replicated these, and um, I feel very confident about this list uh, because my wife and I, Margo, we, we both like to garden. So we garden a lot, and in our situation, we have a, a sun garden where we can test sun plants, and then we have a shade garden, a woodland garden, where we can do woodland plants. And um, so we do replicate. Uh, we have great situations like one year Marjorie was doing a study with junipers and she had these junipers left over and she said, you want to use these for deer? I said, well, this is great. So I took all these plants home and I spread them around so we have uh, different locations on the property to make sure that the deer had access to them and we, able, we were able to judge them. Um, so uh, that's, I just want to say that's why we feel very confident about this list. Now, people always say this to me. When I speak at groups around the country, they're going to say, well, if a deer is hungry enough, they're going to eat anything. Okay. And, you know, there are certain plants that are really poisonous. Okay. These are three plants. I'll talk about the foxglove, the tour, the, the monk's hood. They're a very poisonous plant. If we ate those plants, we'd be dead. If deer ate those plants, they'd be dead. So they don't eat, you know, this is not completely true. Um, but I will believe what Paul said. Paul said that if you have such a high pressure and that they're starving to death, they'll probably eat some of these things. I haven't seen this, but you know, Long Island, Connecticut isn't really a, a situation where um, we, there are a lot of other gardens to go to and they, they can eat other plants. So what I'm gonna do today, I can't obviously talk about all the plants on your list because we only have a half an hour, but, um, but I wanna talk about some of the annuals and I'm going to talk about some of the herbaceous perennials, actually more herbaceous perennials because this group is more interested in that, and then some of the woodies. And we'll just talk until the time's up. Neil, you have to stop me when my time's up. I'll just stop. Because then this afternoon when we're out of bluegrass lane, we'll walk through the, the trowel gardens out there, the, the perennial gardens, and we'll talk more about perennials then. I mean, I'm sorry, about plants that are resistant to deer. And feel free to yell out any questions you have as I go along. But Cleome are one of these plants, I think is, if those of you who are growers or have <clears throat> nurseries, you've probably seen this plant quite popular in recent years, uh, particularly some of the new, new uh, cultivars that have been released, the Cleome Rosalita, for example. A lot of that is being grown, um, probably not because it's deer resistant, but it is quite deer resistant, but because it's short, it's compact, it's very floriferous, that's a nice plant. But any of the Cleome or spider flowers uh, do well. Um, they're annuals. Um, these, the Rosalita is sterile, so it won't reseed itself, but these other, the, the Cleome Hasslerana, <clears throat> will reseed itself and it will act as a perennial. So even though it's an annual, it will continue to come up for you every year. 
Um, a lot of people don't try the colocasias or, or the allocasias uh, because they're kind of expensive. You know, each one of those, those corms is about $10, $12 on Long Island, $25. No, no, <laughs> no, they're about $10 on Long Island too. But they're kind of pricey, but that's okay, you know, because you can put them out in your garden and join for the summer and actually dig them up. I dig up all mine in the, in the fall. Uh, it's very easy. Once they frosted down, I just cut them off, dig them out, shake all the soil, and then throw them in my basement. Uh, it's, it's not, it uh, doesn't freeze, and, uh, and they just, they dry all, all winter, and then in, in the spring, I take them, plant them outside, and they do fine. So even though expensive, they, they do work well. Um, the alocasia is the same way. Uh, kind of a nicer showy plant, the, the leaves, the foliage is more upright in this case. Um, but uh, annual plants, uh, they don't flower, they just offer that foliage kind of uh, attractiveness. <clears throat> Nicotiana is an interesting plant. Uh, this is Nicotiana sylvestris. It has this white plant. We've tried other Nicotianas, the little Nicotiana, the little tobaccos that are so popular, other species. It seems to be that this is the only species that actually is resistant. They won't touch this plant. And uh, other tobaccos that we've tried and tried several times, they will eat. Uh, so I don't quite understand that, but <clears throat> this is what, what we've noticed. Uh, this is another one of those annuals that, uh, that will reseed itself and come up year after year as a, as a perennial. So if you want this plant, it's a tall plant. It gets, it's tall and showy and uh, really nice in, in gardens. And this is the plant that does well in full sun and also does well in a, in a partial shade situation. The penicetums are, are really nice uh, ornamental grasses. Um, I think I might talk about another ornamental grass later, yes, later on in the, in the presentation. Even though I haven't uh, <clears throat> troweled every grass that there is, I would be willing to, to say that probably every grass Every ornamental grass is resistant to deer. I've never seen grasses eaten by deer. The purple fountain grass is really pretty. It's an annual. You can see you can really make some nice um, designs with coleus and other kinds of uh, alocasias and other things to make a nice pot or even a nice section in your garden. Uh, but th these you do need to, to repurchase because they, uh, they are annuals. <clears throat> okay, so those were my annuals. Just there are other ones on your list. Let's move into the herbaceous perennials. I mentioned earlier <clears throat> that the monkswood, one of the most poisonous plants there is. Um, <clears throat> every part of that plant's poisonous from the, the flowers to the leaves to the roots, and deer tend to stay away from it. Um, I should also mention that <clears throat> some plants that are resistant will occasionally get nibbled on. So, like this particular plant, I have several of these in our gardens, and I noticed that <clears throat> that uh, at one point there was, the, the tops were nibbled off. You have to remember that your deer, deer population may be changing, particularly in the spring when you have all the baby deer, you know, the young fawns walking through. <clears throat> they have not, let your, not yet learned that these plants are poisonous or don't taste well. So they'll, they'll take a little nibble <clears throat> and then, you know, of course they damage your plant, uh, but they're not gonna eat the whole plants. They won't be back after that, after they take their first taste, um, they usually leave the plant alone. Agastache, very dependable plants. Uh, this was also on Connie's list for, for uh, pollinators. Um, this is a very hardy perennial. It smells very nice. It might be the fragrance that these leaves um, <clears throat> give off to keep the deer away. Uh, it, a lot of pollinators go to these plants too. I will say though, if you grow this plant, um, it is I don't want to use the I word, the invasive word, but it will spread a lot in your garden. So you have to be careful about that. It comes up here and there. <clears throat> but a great plant, you can get in purples and whites and blues. Uh, the aliums uh, are very resistant to the deer. Uh, it always kinds of surprised me that um, plants like this, which we eat, you know, we find as culinary plants, the deer won't eat. <clears throat> so um, they don't touch it. Uh, the garlic chives are interesting, however. The garlic chives for us down on Long Island are just starting to bud. That's the part actually that you eat if you're gonna use it in cooking, it, you know, before the flowers actually open, you know, when they're more in this, this bud-like stage here. <clears throat> that's when you cut them to put them into different kinds of uh, eggs or whatever you're cooking. I will have noticed that the deer, if they do eat this plant, they will eat it when the, the buds are coming out. Uh, not 
frequently, but they will do that. Blue Star, which is a, a native plant, the Amsonia, Tabernay, Montana. Um, this is kind of a plant that is uh, promoted as a shade plant. It also does quite well in full sun. Uh, this is a plant that flowers early in the summer. And um, <clears throat> usually what I do with this plant after it flowers, I just cut it all the way down to the ground and it will come back in the summer thicker and nicer and it gives you a nice thick green uh, kind of bushy kind of plant. <clears throat> All the Artemisias, we've tested, uh, well, probably not every species of Artemisia, but we've tried, tried many of the Artemisias, and they all have been resistant uh, to, it, the, uh, to the deer. The, um, like plants like the tangerine southernwood, not a particularly attractive plant. Um, it has a place in the garden, but it doesn't really flower, and it doesn't really do much. It doesn't even have that light white color that the other species have up here, but um, the deer won't eat it. And uh, the Artemisias, um, like Ludovisiana, white sage is a very aggressive grower. If you have it in your garden, it's going to spread quite a bit. Uh, Schmidiana, just, um, it's just the opposite. It kind of barely survives the winter sometimes. Palace Castle, I love Palace Castle. Um, very dependable in the garden. That's one of those plants that um, when it, uh, in the wintertime, there'll be some damage on it, but it rarely will that plant die. It just will... Maybe just sections of it will die and it will come back. So, uh, but it's, it's a great plant to give you some of that um, fine textures from the foliage as well as that light colored leaves. The Asclepius, this was a, uh, one of those, pl those plants that I was just so surprised. We were uh, maybe about 10 years ago sitting in uh, a friend of ours' uh, backyard having a drink or whatever, and he had a field just a, an empty field next to his property. And, you know, we could see the deer walking through the field and, you know, the conversation always goes around deer. And then I noticed that the butterfly weed was just all over that field. I thought, so I thought, why aren't those deer eating those butterfly weeds? So we tried this and they're resistant. The deer won't touch this plant. <clears throat> and uh, it's very, very pretty garden orna ornamental, just primarily in the orange color. But you can try the other species, uh, both of these, are, belong to that category for the uh, pollinator gardens, particularly butterfly gardens. So the, uh, the milkweed, also uh, a plant that you don't see too frequently in gardens, but you should see more of because the deer won't touch it <coughs> and they are good for, for the pollinators. Calamintha, uh, particularly this white cloud. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this. Some of you sell this plant, the white cloud. It's really a spectacular little plant. Um, blooms quite a lot, uh, very easy to propagate if you're into propagating your own plants. Uh, you could probably just take a cutting and throw it in the ground and it would root for you. So uh, very interesting grower, very uh, aggressive grower because it's in that mint family which are so easy to grow and so dependable. So try the Calamintas if you haven't tried those. <clears throat> Again, this is one of those plants like the grasses I would be willing to, you know, say without actually having tested all the carex species, I would be willing to say that these are probably all resistant to deer. Um, this, you know, this weeping brown sage, it's no wonder because the deer probably think it's dead, you know, because it doesn't look like a dead plant. But uh, the carex are dependable plants, the deer stay away from. Um, there will be occasional nibbling. I think this is one of the plants that they're trying to test to see if they like it, but they usually stay away from this plant. Foxglove, one of my favorites, you know, it's a, it's a true biennial, but it, it, like some of the other plants, will act as a perennial because it will reseed itself and keep coming up. If you have a garden that you don't mind uh, a little, uh, I'll say messiness, this is a plant when it reseeds, it comes up here and there, you know, it's not in the same location every year, but it looks really nice if you have a natural looking garden. And don't forget that there is a yellow form of the digitalis, the foxglove grandiflora, it's a little shorter. Uh, has a yellow flower and deer stay away from that one too. But very poisonous. You know, this is the plant that they make digitoxin from. So if any of you take heart medicine, this is the plant that they make that from. So if you, if you chew on the leaves, don't chew on the leaves. But if, <laughs> but if you did, your, your heart would do a little palpitations there. Euphorbia is another group of plant that the deer stay away from. Um, We've tried many kinds, many of the species of euphorbias, and they seem to all be uh, resistant to the deer, or the deer stay away from them. 
Um, it's no wonder, you know, a lot of the euphorbias kind of are toxic. You know, people say for years that poinsettias were poisonous. They're not, but uh, these are. Some of them are very bad. Uh, like the donkey tail spurge, this is one of my, my favorite ones because it does get its flower earlier in the summer with that yellow, you know, just when you need some color in the garden, you get that yellow flowers. And then all summer long, you get the blue, green, gray foliage. Um, but this is a plant, all the euphorbias really, that you should be aware of that when, you, when you're pruning them or taking cuttings, they do produce that sap. And uh, several people are allergic to that. They'll break out in a skin rash. So if, if you're out gardening with those and you notice that your skin's getting red and itchy, it might be because of that plant. And one of my favorites, the hellebores, uh, if you need a plant for deep shade, our woodland garden, we have this everywhere. The hellebores are everywhere. And um, we've been finding with this plant that they do set their own seeds and they will, you, you know, uh, repopulate their the forest with uh, just seedlings. So we have these everywhere. The deer never touch these plants. Uh, lots of different colors now that are available. And uh, if you haven't tried these, try these. If you get them by seedlings, of course, they're going to take a couple years before they flower, uh, sometimes up to three. But if you buy them in from plugs, you're probably looking at two years. <coughs> Lamy Astrum, this is not one of my 95% plants, um, the, the yellow archangel. Uh, because the deer will come around in this very early spring and they'll nibble the plants usually right before they set, right after they set bud, so you don't get the flower, but you will keep the, the, the foliage. This cultivar Herman's Pride, however, uh, the deer tend to stay away from it. That's more clumpy. It's not, it's not a trailer, it's more of a clumpy plant. And um, the deer don't seem to like that one as much as the regular true species. I'm not sure why, but that's, that's what happens. Its cousin, Lamium, Lamium and Lamiastrum, they used to be the same genus, but then taxonomists realized that they were two different plants. Lamium are even more dependable than the Lamiastrum. Rarely do you see plants, uh, a deer, excuse me, rarely do you see deer eating these plants. Um, and this is a good shade plant. It also does okay in full sun, but it's mostly a shade plant. And as you can tell just from these cultivars, you can get a lot of flower variety. You can also get a lot of foliage diversity. And um, so there, you can have all kinds of cultivars in your garden and do very nicely with this. <clears throat> Lavenders, um, you know, are one of the very most popular plants. Stay, deers do stay away from this. Um, we have some lavender fields on the eastern end of Long Island that people come in and they'll, they'll pay $8.50 just to walk through the lavender field. And, um, this time of year they're blooming and then they have, once the flowers dry out, they sell the dried flowers. <clears throat> People always complain about this plant dying in the garden, but you have to remember with lavenders, they're one of the last things to come out in the spring. So they do get woody stems and people will, they'll be out in the garden, other things are gonna be grown and they'll look at the lavender and they'll, th they'll think that the plant is dead, but don't, you know, just be patient with that plant. It will probably leaf out for you. But the foliage is great in uh, you know, that gray-green color. The ligularias, lots of ligularias to use. Uh, these are also shade plants. Um, you can, you know, they do very dependably. They don't like to dry out. Um, in our garden, we don't, we don't have irrigation other than when I'm out there with a the hose. So um, when they're dry, they'll just go flat. But they do kind of pop back. Um, interesting kind of yellowish flowers. That Othello has that orange-yellow flower. I'm not sure if I like that color, but um, that's about the only colors that you can get with these, uh, with this uh, particular genus. Mints, all the mints. This is another example where, where we as humans eat mints or we use them in drinks, like mojito time, and, um, but the deer won't touch them, okay? It, don't you wish that they kind of ate some of these plants because they're so invasive, <laughs> they spread everywhere. If you do grow the mints, you might want to put them into a pot because once they're in the ground, they're everywhere. And as Paul mentioned, the daffodils, all the daffodils are, uh, are disliked by the deer for some reason. Um, but you will notice, some people say to me, oh, you know, my daffodils have been nibbled by the deer. Well, remember when the, when the daffodils are flowering early summer, or late spring, whatever you want to call it, you know, there are babies around, the baby fawns, uh, or there's, they may be extremely hungry after that winter, and they're going to taste, taste those buds. But once they find out that they don't like them, they leave them alone. The catnips, the cat mints, 
uh, dependable. Deer will stay away from these plants. Uh, they get beautiful blue flowers in early summer. Uh, nice bushy plants, dependable. This is a plant very similar to the blue star that once it's done blooming, just, I just whack the thing back and it's gonna flower for you a second time in the summer. Uh, a very nice plant, a little aggressive. This too will recede and come up different places. Um, and if you have cats, some nice little kitty drugs to give to your cat. <laughs> oregano, you know, people don't think about oregano um, as, as a ornamental too much, but you know, right now the oreganos uh, down in Long Island are flowering. We have all kinds of flowers. They're whites and pinks and kind of these purple colors. Uh, you know, people usually think of oregano just as a culinary herb, something that you're going to use when you're making pizzas or if you're making sauce. But, um, you know, consider this as an ornamental in your garden because they, they do have pretty flowers and they are actually used as cut flowers in, um, by some farm stands. The pachysanders are great, very dependable. Uh, the, the one that most people think of is the pachysander terminalis just the regular old traditional pachysander. It's cheap and does well in shade, full shade. It spreads by rhizomes. But don't forget its cousin, the natural species, the uh, pachysander procumbens, which is um, also quite in, uh, resistant to deer, uh, dependable. It doesn't grow anywhere as quickly as uh, terminalis, but it will add a nice addition. It's somewhat uh, deciduous. It's kind of semi-deciduous. Uh, the foliage will turn this kind of bronze purple color uh, in the fall and then also it does flower in the spring. Not, not spectacular flowers, but interesting. Mark, maybe three minutes? Okay, okay. Yeah, just kind of, yeah, stop, three minutes. Uh, I haven't gotten to the woodies yet, but that's okay. We're all green husband. We'd rather have herbacea. Yes. <laughs> um, peonies, very good, very dependable. Deer stay away from them. They don't even nibble on these. And of course, you know, in the garden, they're always fun to see come out of the ground in the spring. Those purple, the pur purple stems are kind of very interesting color addition to your garden. Uh, of course, you know, the peonies, they do need stake to hold up the flowers, but, um, but they're well worth the energy. Perovskias, um, I don't know how hardy Perovskias are up here. Um, they are, okay, they're hardy up here, okay. So a um, lot of great, great uh, color again in the foliage and then they get the pretty light blue flowers. Another native plant, the mayapple, um, a beautiful plant, you know, it flowers, then it gets the little, um, the fruit on it that some people make jam out of. Uh, and then about now, down, right now on, on Long Island, they're mostly dying back. Uh, they usually die before the end of summer, but um, deer won't touch these plants. Salvias, this is another culinary herb that we use a lot, right? The, just the sage that we, we use in stuffing and soups and all kinds of things. People grow it as an herb, but don't forget that it has a spectacular flower in about the same time that the catnips or cat mints are flowering, early summer, they get this blue covering. Uh, they're covered with blue flowers, uh, a really hardy plant, dependable. This is another one that once it's done blooming, I cut it all the way back to the ground, and then you get this great, you know, this great gray green foliage for the summer in that particular location. Santalinas, uh, they're both, uh, deer won't eat these plants. Uh, they're kind of fun plants they, because these are kinds of plants that if you're into shaping up little topiaries, you know, if you have like way too much free time on your hands, you can do that with these plants. Lamb's ear are great. Uh, again, another one with this whitish gray foliage. And people have often asked me if, they th if we think that it's because of this white coloration that's what keep deer away, I don't, I don't really know. But it does seem to be that there are a lot of plants that have kind of a whitish gray foliage that deer don't eat. Uh, feverfew, uh, this is a plant that's everywhere in our gardens, in the shade garden, in the sun garden. Uh, it recedes itself and it comes back uh, dependably every year and the deer never touch it. I if you've ever smelled it, you probably know why they stay away from it. Time, don't forget you can never have enough time. And so this is true with the plant also. Um, all the times, again, I haven't tried all the species of thyme, but I'd be willing to say that the deer don't touch these at all, any of them. Peri periwinkle, um, it's pretty dependable. And um, evergreen, a good shade plant. Okay, let's go into the woodies. I just have a few woodies. Budlia, um, deer don't touch this plant. But I know what somebody in this audience is going to say to me, it's invasive, right? People, this is get, 
It's not on the invasive plant list, but it's going to get there. Uh, Budlias come in white and purple and kind of a blue colored. So that's why Nora up there is doing this breeding work with Vitex. Uh, Vitex is a good uh, replacement for the Budlia. It looks almost exactly like it, except it has these marijuana-like leaves that, um, that are not like Budlias. They don't have the same effect. You know, we try to smoke them, but it just doesn't, doesn't do the same thing. <laughs> but Nora, you know what, if we can get that kind of marijuana kind of activity, that might not be so bad. But anyway, so uh, Vitex, it's not supposed to be hardy up here in, in Ithaca, but we noticed that at Cornell Plantations last year, they planted several plants and they all lived the winter. Of course, it was a mild winter, but we'll see what happens. But this is typically a plant for more warmer. Zone 7, Long Island Zone 7. Boxwoods, we mentioned boxwoods. Paul mentioned boxwood earlier too. Uh, deer won't eat it, but yes, there is that disease problem. Uh, but Marjorie, there are certain cultivars that are resistant, right, to the, the boxwood blight? Is that what you're? Okay. Oh, the same disease? Oh, yikes. Yeah, oh, that's too bad. But boxwoods, deer won't touch the boxwood. Um, a lot of different cultivars, but we, we have several in our own personal garden, and some of them just, they are wonderful looking. They don't get affected by any kind of disease. The junipers, a lot of the junipers are um, resistant to deer, but I won't say every juniper is, so look on the list. I have the list of the ones that are. And one of my favorite native plants, of course, is the bayberry. Um, this is a plant, it's, it's kind of a deciduous plant um, that we grow a lot in Long Island because it's very drought tolerant. It also tolerates salt water. Uh, don't forget that the bayberry is uh, dioecious. So you have female plants and male plants. And uh, if you want these pretty berries, you're going to have to get the females. And then the tree peony also, there's a difference between the tree peony and the herbaceous peony. Um, this one is a woody, and um, you don't want to cut this one down in the fall. If you cut this one down in the fall, you're cutting the stem off and you're cutting the flowers off for next year. So, so the tree peony, don't prune that back to the ground, please. And I think, so we should cut it short, you think? Okay, so I do, before we um, get to the very end, I do want to mention that we are organizing this um, eco tour in May. If anybody's interested, see me about it. It's 11 days in the Galapagos. Uh, I've done this before, and it's the most wonderful experience of your life. And uh, it's, not, it's not a vacation. Uh, every day we have, in the morning we get up at 6, we leave at 6, and we hike for three hours on a different island. And um, then we snorkel for about three hours. And then in the end of the day we hike again. So it, it's not for the faint of heart, but if you're interested in something that would be one of the most exciting experiences of your life, please come see me. And I guess we don't really have much time, but I will be out in, in, in the bluegrass lane this this afternoon if you have questions. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.